grab your stakes, and get your weird friends ready. It's time to go monster hunting. This is a review of Monster of the Week Hardcover Edition. Here we have our Monster of the Week book, our hardcover edition. I must say I am really digging this actual cover art this time around as opposed to the soft cover art, which you can see right here. I, I, I just like it a lot more. It's a lot more action-y, I feel like. A lot more dark. Just new, I suppose. So let's see what's on the back. A monster lurks in the shadows. Most people don't believe in monsters, but you know the truth. They're real, and it's your task to bring them down. This hardcover edition of Monster of the Week brings that, that adventure to life. Monster of the Week is a standalone action horror RPG for three to five people. Hunt high school beasties a la Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Travel the country to bring down unnatural creatures like the supernatural Winchester Brothers, or head up the government investigation like Mulder and Scully. This book contains everything you need to tackle Bigfoot, collar a chupacabra, and drive away demons. That's pretty sweet. So this was by Evil Hat Productions and Generic Games. Um, although the soft cover edition came back, came out way back in 2015, and it is by Michael Sands. Monster of the Week was actually my first introduction to the whole Powered by the Apocalypse engine games. Although it would still be some years before I actually got to play one of those games in the form of City of of Mist. Now, if you're late to the party, the Apocalypse Engine is primarily concerned with focusing on the PCs with a mechanics-like game engine that's very heavy on the narrative aspect. This means that you'll be rolling dice to do things, as you would in just about every other RPG, but it's up to you as a player or the Keeper to really describe what happens. It's uh, fiction first, more so than mechanics. So what did it look like when you did that magic thing? You are given a hard choice for your miss. Will you leave your friends behind and get away safely or will the monster's attention turn to you? So as a player, sometimes you're gonna be given those little choices to kind of narrate um, how the action goes against or for your character. This game is very heavy on the improvisation aspect of the role-playing experience. And that doesn't mean it's a difficult game, as we'll find out as we take a look at the playbooks and the mechanics of the game. It just kind of asks you to really think about certain aspects of the, the whole fiction. And the first thing that I really want to talk about is the uh, how the book is laid out, or I guess, well, as we'll see in the table of contents. So we do have our standard introduction chapter, which I think for the Apocalypse Engine games is very important because this is a very new presentation of the role-playing aspect of these games. Then we get to, uh, then we get some details about the hunters and the first session, and then we actually get into character creation in the form of the playbooks. And as you kind of look through the table of contents, um, you're probably looking at this uh, as in terms of what can I look at in terms of the player. And I would say that a majority of this book is written with the GM, or the Keeper as they call it in this case, in mind. Everything, with the exception of the playbooks, is for the Keeper. And I kind of really like that, that whole mentality that the players don't really need to know the specifics until they need to know it, until they actually do that thing. So when you're actually playing one of these games, um, what I've done is I've only given my my players a couple of things, really actually two things, their playbook slash their character or and the basic moves. And I would even kind of say you don't have to give the basic moves right at the beginning because you don't want them to get bogged down with the mechanics. You want them to get absorbed in the fiction and the narrative first. And then when something comes up, that they need to actually roll for something, that's when you would say, okay, well, that sounds like kick ass. So why don't you um, take two dice and roll with this uh, stat? And then I would probably give them the basic sheets after they've kind of got the flow of things. But anyways, let's talk about character creation. Character creation is, well, it's actually really easy. All you need is a playbook, which is your character class, if you will. The 
playbook tells you just about everything you need to know in setting up your character, and a good keeper, that's the GM, will walk the group through the entire process. Uh, it really only comes down to selecting stats, which every playbook has different stats to choose from, or rather, a different line of stats. Um, they all have the same five stats, such as charm, cool, sharp, tough, and weird, but there's an allocation of those stats are different. So you actually get to pick one. So as we see in this example, the chosen, um, there are five boxes and we get to pick one line. He can either have a charm of plus two, cool minus one, sharp plus one, tough plus two, and weird minus one, or maybe he might have uh, charm minus one, cool plus one, sharp plus two, tough minus one, and weird plus two. So it kind of gives you a little bit of flexibility. In addition to selecting your stats, each playbook has some specific moves. And every playbook has a different selection to actually choose from in that sense. And there are also some other narrative bits, like for the chosen, again, we have to pick uh, two um, from these heroic and dooms, and they kind of tell the, narr the keeper um, different things that they can pull in for the game and things like that. The history questions towards the end of the playbook also kind of highlight that this is more of a narrative game and it really uh, puts a spotlight on the, 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 the player characters. So what are the playbooks? Well, we have the chosen. Uh, your birth was prophesized. You are the chosen one and with your abilities, you can save the world. If you fail, all will be destroyed. It all rests on you, only you. We have the crooked. Yeah, I've been around the block. A bit of this, a bit of that. When I came across the secret underworld of monsters and magic, well, it wasn't so different from the underworld I already, already knew. It was easy to find an angle, just like before. We have the divine. I am the light, the sword. I am sent to defend the meek from darkness. All evil fears me, for I am its end. We have the expert. I have dedicated my life to the study of the unnatural. I know their habits, their weaknesses. I may not be youngest or strongest, but my knowledge makes me the biggest threat. We have the flake. Everything's connected, when not everyone can see the patterns, and most people don't even look that hard. But me? I can never stop looking deeper. I can never stop seeing the truth. I spot the patterns. That's how I found the monsters, and that's how I helped kill them. We have the initiate. Since the dawn of history, we have been the bulwark against darkness. We know the evils of the world and we stand against them so that the mass of humanity need not fear. We are the flame that cleanses the shadow. We have the monstrous. I feel the hunger, the lust to destroy, but I fight it. I never give in. I'm not human anymore, not really, but I have to protect those who still are. That way, I can tell myself I'm different to the other monsters. Sometimes, I can even believe it. We have the mundane. You heard about how monsters only pick on people with crazy powers who can fight back on even terms? Yeah, me neither. But hell, I ended up in the monster hunting team, so I gotta do what I can, right? We have the professional. It's kind of strange when your regular 9 to 5 job is to hunt down monsters. Still, that's the job I took on when I joined the outfit. It pays well and the benefits are good. Like they say, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it sure helps. You got the snoop. Cryptids have kept out of sight but I'm going to find them and record them. The evidence will be incontrovertible, and I'll be the one who did it. I'm going to be a superstar one day. You mark my words. Hey, did, did you just feel a chill? The Spell Slinger. Fight fire with fire magic. The Spooktacular. I've traveled all over, pretty much everywhere you can make a dollar. I've made people happy, and I guess I know it a few. But everywhere you go has monsters. This show included. The Spooky. I can do things, things that normal people can't, but there's a price. I haven't paid it in full yet, but the bill's gonna come due soon. It's best I don't tell you any more. You get too close, you'll get hurt. And then, the wronged. They took my loved ones, back when I wasn't strong enough to fight, but I studied, trained, and now I'm ready to cleanse the world of their taint. I'll kill them all, that's all I have left. Powered by the Apocalypse games, put the characters and the team at the forefront, more so than any other system I've reviewed so far on the channel. Character creation is meant to be done together with the other players and with the Keeper. The Keeper is going to keep tabs on the important little details, whether it be a rival or the impending end of days, because you kind of chose to play as the Chosen, 
The other players are keeping tabs on how they can tie in your character to yours. And the history questions towards the end of the process kind of highlight this aspect. I actually really like the playbooks. They're, they are tropes of the genre and that only solidifies the theme. There are enough variations between the playbooks to keep things fresh, especially if your, your best friend took the one that you really wanted to play, as because you could only have one of each of them on the team. I really do like how easy the process is. It doesn't weigh the players down with needless information because everything has to fit in on two sheets allocated to the playbook. And if you haven't seen my character creation tutorial video, then go back and watch that and you can see that for the majority of the, the video, I just used that, that, that playbook. I didn't really have to lug the hardcover out. So if you're coming into this from a more conventional game like Dungeons and Dragons or any D20 based game, uh, you might notice that Monster of the Week and other games like it are very much different. You still get to do things, and you still get to roll dice. Uh, once you say you're going to do something, your keeper will probably say something like, oh, that seems like such and such move. Go ahead and roll, roll for that. Moves are what allow you to do things. They are actions. So let's take a look at those basic moves that all players have access to. We have Act Under Pressure. This is the general purpose move for any time a hunter tries something that is dangerous or liable to fail and isn't covered by any other moves. Then you have help out. This is used when a hunter wants to help another hunter make a move and usually that means it's, you're going to give them plus one on, the, on a single roll. You have investigate a mystery. Obviously this is what you use to actually look into certain aspects of the mystery and you do get to ask the keeper some questions um, if you should actually succeed. Then you have kick some ass. This is your basic fighting move, covering the back and forth of a short burst of fighting rather than a single attack. Then you have manipulate someone. Use when you want to convince somebody to do something else, although it's not just a be all catch all thing. Um, you can't just go up to somebody and say, hey, uh, go fight this monster for me and then roll. You actually have to convince them with words to make it applicable or else they're just going to say no and the keeper has full freedom to do that. Then you have protect someone. This can be used anytime someone is about to suffer harm, including as the result of another move, such as kick ass. You basically throw yourself uh, in front of whatever's attacking them and take the hit for them, sometimes at a minus harm. Then you have read a bad situation. This move is for when a hunter goes into a situation they know is hostile. It's kind of like your perception check a little bit, only you have to know that there's something horrible waiting for you on the other side of that door. Then you have use magic. This is the big move that allows you to, well, use magic. And there's a whole list of things that you can do with magic, such as inflict harm or enchant a weapon. But be forewarned, magic comes with a price and sometimes you might get some glitches. And then you have big magic. So let's say that you want to perform a ritual that will kind of help you out narrative wise or story wise. Well, that, that's probably going to be big magic. There needs to be some sort of, I wouldn't say sacrifice because that, that kind of sounds like you're sacrificing a goat at the altar, but there's got to be some big payment for stuff like that. So regardless of what move you perform, you roll 2d6 and add the stat, which can range from minus one to plus three. Anything six or below is considered a miss. Something bad happens, but that doesn't mean that it's a failure. The story still progresses. The keeper will tell you what happens. On a seven through nine, you get a partial success. This means that you do the thing you were trying to do, but there's some sort of a complication. On a 10 plus, you really do the thing you were going to do and with some sort of a benefit. And that's really all there is for the player's side of things. You do something and then you make a move. Either the keeper will tell you or you can initiate it. But fiction first, more so than mechanics. You roll and figure out what happens. A lot of the moves do require input on the player's side. And this isn't a game where you announce that you're going to do this move and then roll with a success or failure. In order to do a move, like I said, you have to actually do the thing to trigger the move. And not everything requires a move. Moves are only made if there's a chance of uncertainty or some sort of a drama. So what about combat? You finally corner the werewolf, now what? 
Combat is very free form. You say what you want to do, and if it aligns with the move, you roll to see what happens. However, doing so comes with risk. So if we go back to the kick some ass move, uh, you can see that on a success, you inflict harm and suffer harm from whatever you're fighting. But, however, if you roll a 10+, plus, you can choose one extra effect, like you suffer less harm, like minus one harm. So kick some ass is the basic fighting move that you're gonna use a lot of the times. There is no initiative. The only order is the one that really makes sense. Who wants to do something? He's going to attack. Can I help him so he can get some sort of advantage? Sure, how do you help him out? I'm gonna be a distraction as the, uh, for the werewolf. All right, well, roll to help out. I actually really like this style of combat it's not restrictive and it actually feels natural. However, it can get really easy to focus on one character. So if you're the keeper, remember to ask what the others are doing every once in a while. I personally think that playing the game is much easier than running the game. I think we can all agree that that particular statement is somewhat true across the board, no matter which game that you're playing. I also think that those who run the game, in this case the Keeper, have much more to do than in other systems, and a lot of it boils down to your improvisation skills. There is all sorts of advice on how to run the game, from the very first session all the way to creating an arc after the first mystery. In those regards, when you're planning a mystery, a lot of the advice boils down to create a monster, create the minions, create the bystanders, Tie in any character's arcs if you can, and that's it. You play to find out what happens. What they're really trying to say is don't over plan because you can't possibly predict how well or how poorly the players are going to roll. And whatever you do, don't try to railroad them because the game doesn't work that way with the on the fly improvisation required. So there are two adventures, actually I believe there's three adventures that really help newbie keepers kind of get into running the game. The first one is the the Mongolian death worm, which is more of a this is how to run an adventure and this is why I've written these things. Um, it's definitely written in the form of some advice. I wouldn't really say it's a fully fleshed out, although as a first session thing you can totally run it that way. And then you have an introductory mystery, Dream Away the Time, which kind of is all along the same process, this time with actual bystanders and NPCs um, listed out. Um, that is actually a really cool one. I really like the major twists that happen in that story. You're basically tasked with uh, finding out why this town has some mysterious like weather phenomena and things like that. Almost like there's some sort of a curse upon it. And then by the end of the game, you kind of realize that it's, uh, I guess he's an elf king or something like that, is kind of behind it because of some promise made long, long ago and things like that. And there's also another twist with one of the uh, NPCs in there, which I will not spoil because it's actually pretty cool. And then you have the Damn Dirty Apes mystery which takes place on a, at a university and there's like some mad scientist who's kind of angry at, you know, being fired or something like that. And so he creates these mutant and robotic cybernetic uh, apes to kind of kidnap the other professors and things like that. It's actually really funny in a way. And so there's all sorts of advice and, you know, lots of examples, examples of play in this book for the keeper. And I, as I said before in the very beginning, this book is written with the Keeper in mind. I don't think it's really written for the players because really when it comes down to it, all you're going to do is give them their playbook and the basic moves sheet and then you're just going to go from there. So I really do like that this book is aimed at the Keeper or the person running the game. This is very much a rule book that is meant for the person running the game to kind of read through and get some advice and some ideas to kind of get the ball rolling. If I was going to play this with some new people, I'd only give them two things, their playbook and their basic moves sheet, which 
I might not do right off the bat. I might actually let them just play, say what they're going to do, and if it translates into a move, then I would go ahead and interrupt and say, hey, you know what? Um, that sounds like a certain uh, check that we're gonna make. So why don't you go ahead, uh, roll 2d6 and add your weird stat to that, and then see how that goes. And so I wouldn't really give them the moves until they need to know the moves. I want to get them soaked up in that, that fiction first before I introduce the mechanics. The most important thing you can do as a keeper is to let your players think about what their character is doing in that narrative. Would I play this game with my players? Hell yeah. Uh, but make no mistake, I don't really think this is a game that can have much success in the long term. I don't see this being played out for years and years as you hear some D&D stories. This, is, this game is mainly meant for shorter bursts or maybe like a one shot. So that really leaves me with my final thought. Is this a good introduction to Powered by the Apocalypse Engine games? It's a really tough question because each game does something different. Each one has a different theme, each one has different mechanics outside of the basic moves and things like that. But Monster of the Week, I guess is what I would call mainstream Apocalypse Engine. I mean, it's kind of up there with the likes of Masks and City of Mist and I guess now Avatar Legends, although we'll get to my thoughts on that one in a different video. I guess what I'm really trying to say in a roundabout way is that you should play this game if you and your players are into that sort of thing. I've seen on Reddit quite a bit on certain subreddits asking, what is the perfect game to introduce to my players in terms of Powered by the Apocalypse Engine games, or which one is the best? And a lot of the comments, and I have to agree with them, say, don't think of it in terms of that way. Think about what genre you and your players enjoy the most, because that's what you're really going to buy into. That's what's going to really grab them. And I wholeheartedly agree. I like this game because it kind of fits in there with some of the things that I like, Horror and, you know, action, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Supernatural are one of the major influences for this book. And I can see that my players are also into that sort of thing as well. So that's actually going to do it for this review. Feel free to leave a comment down below. Give this video a huge thumbs up to support this series. And I will see you guys in the next video.